Let me start this video by saying that I'm not claiming to have invented this idea. What I mean is, while I didn't get it from something else that I've seen, I highly doubt that I'm the first person to ever try this technique. So if you've ever seen it elsewhere, or if you're the person who did think of this first, congratulations, and we all commend you. Now let's move on. Okay, so with that out of the way, the first thing that I did was break down all of my boards of beech wood into some more manageable sized chunks using my jigsaw. And then I could joint one edge, rip the other, and then cut my ends square. Basically getting myself to where I had some nice pieces of wood as a starting point for refining things. Now, I was hoping that by cross-cutting and ripping my individual pieces, I would remove most of the curvature in them. And I probably did. But it turned out that there were a few pieces that were still a little bit more bent than I wanted, so I ran those pieces over the joiner a couple times, and then I could plane everything to their finished thicknesses. Anyway, and by the time I was done with that, it was getting pretty late, so I decided to shut it down for the day. And while I'm sleeping, let's quickly go over the design so that you have a better idea of how things are going to look moving forward. So because this piece is more about experimenting with a technique, I decided to make the table heavily based off of another one of my designs, the spider coffee table. So it's basically just a square version of that. The table is going to consist of seven pieces total, four identical legs, two almost identical stretchers, and a glass top. So really we only need to make three unique pieces. Two and a half. Okay, fine, two and a half. The next morning I grabbed my blanks and began refining them, and I started off with the stretcher pieces. Now back when I had ripped these, I had made them their finished widths, so next I had to mark out what their finished lengths should be. And after that was done, I could grab my template and trace out the curved detail shape that they would have along their top edge. And actually, let's go back in time for a second to talk about those template pieces, since those are pretty important. So there's kind of two ways that you can make these. And most of the time I would just use my X-Carve to get the job done, but I think it's good to show the manual process every now and again, so that's what I'm going to do here. Next, I basically just look at my original drawing and reference where various angles start and end and try to copy degrees if possible. Basically just do my best to translate my drawing into a real life piece of MDF. Nothing really too technical. Next, I'm going to use my Rockler crosscut sled, tapering jig, and some sanders to get my templates finalized. And the important thing to remember is that 95% of what's going on here is purely aesthetic. Like really the only thing that matters with these particular templates is this joint right here. And to get that just right, I'm going to actually put the templates together. And if it's not perfect, I'll just sand it a bit to make it perfect. And once I'm satisfied, I can start using them. All right, let's go back to the future. Great Scott. Wait, I feel like this doesn't make sense. Shouldn't it be the part where Doc is telling Marty that- Channel it into the flux capacitor. It just might work. Next Saturday night, we're sending you back to the- Okay, so with my stretchers all marked up, the last thing that I wanted to do before I shaped the actual piece was to cut half laps on each piece where they're gonna join. And this wasn't too hard, but we do have to plan a little bit ahead just because of this particular shape. So if you're not familiar, here's a detail shot of the way that the joint's gonna work. Where the pieces overlap, the stretchers are going to be an inch and a half wide. So that means each half lap needs to be cut three quarters of an inch deep. But because we want to do this before we shape the stretcher, that means we need to make sure that we cut an extra half inch deep into this piece. 
So while I was marking up my pieces, I made sure to label everything and double check my work so that I don't get confused when I'm making the actual cuts. And to make the actual cuts, I'm just going to slowly raise my blade to get the cut right where I want it. And then once that's set, I can use the eighth inch drill bit trick to make the dado perfectly sized. Once everything looked good, I repeated this process again on the other stretcher, and then I could test fit them. And you can see here that the joint is definitely on the tight side, but I like that because it means that after I do all of my sanding, they should go together easily enough, but still be pretty tight. Okay, now let's set the stretchers aside for a minute and work on the leg pieces. And again here, I'm going to start by tracing my template shape onto my leg blanks. Then over at the bandsaw, I can cut them out, just making sure that I stay proud of the line that represents the inside angle of the leg. The next thing we need to work on is that crucial joint, the miter joint. And to cut that, we're going to make some temporary sleds that we'll use over at the table saw. So first I grabbed a piece of plywood that I had sitting around, locked my fence down, and established a cut line. Then I could take my template piece and match the miter face with the cut line. And I apologize that this is so out of focus because it's actually a pretty crucial step that I really wish I had captured. But I guess you'll just have to use your imagination. So anyway, once I had it flush, I clamped it down and you know what? Actually, I, I think I can fix this. Hang on. Okay. One or two? Three or four? Okay. Five or six? And how's that? Clear? Perfect. And I guess this seems like a good time to thank Warby Parker for sponsoring this video. So my wife and I have actually been getting our glasses from Warby Parker for the past probably seven years or so. And there's a few reasons why. First is the convenience. You can go online, take a quiz, and they'll suggest pairs that fit your face and style, which is a great starting point. And from there, you can do a home try-on kit where you'll select up to five pairs that they'll send to your home for you to try on. It's totally free, shipping's paid both ways, and there's no obligation to buy. And actually now, if you have an iPhone 10 or newer, you can even virtually try on glasses, which is pretty cool. Next is the price. Glasses start at $95, and that includes prescription lenses with anti-glare and anti-scratch coatings. And for us, it was that combination of selection, quality, convenience, and price that got us to try and then ultimately stick with Warby Parker for such a long time. And actually more recently, they've even introduced Scout contact lenses, which they say are made from super moist material that resists drying for lasting hydration and comfort. And you can wear them for less than $1.25 per day. Now, I actually used to wear contact lenses, and cost and comfort were two of the reasons that I stopped. So, I don't know. I might give them a try again if I want to do the whole two eyes thing. We'll see. That said, if you wear glasses, or if you just want to look like you do, or if you're in the market for sunglasses because they make those too, I cannot recommend Warby Parker highly enough. So head over to warbyparker.com slash four eyes to take advantage of their free home try on program or request a six day trial of their scout contact lenses for just five bucks. By the way, I decided to go with the Watts for my new pair. I wanted to try something a little rounder and different than my other pairs. Okay, thanks Warby Parker. Now let's get back to the build. All right, so with my piece lined up, I clamped it down and used a piece of scrap and some screws to make a fence that my workpiece could rest against. Then I could line up my marks with the cut line, clamp it to the fence, and use my table saw to cut a perfect miter. After that, I could repeat this cut to make miters on the other three ends of the stretcher piece, and then pretty much do the same thing to the leg pieces. Only there I'd have to make cuts on both ends, for where the miter face is and for where the leg's gonna hit the ground. With that out of the way, the rest of shaping the leg is mostly just aesthetic. The joints and mating faces and all the business ends are done, so next I took my stretcher piece over to the bandsaw and again trimmed proud of the line and then used my template and a couple of flush trim bits to get the piece to its final shape. Mm -hmm. 
Finally, once I was happy with everything, I could glue up my miters. And this is where we're gonna start getting into the more experimental part of this build. So you'll notice that I'm not using any jigs for clamping pressure, not reinforcing the joints with any dominoes or dowels or splines. I'm literally just putting glue on the miter faces and sticking them together with hand pressure. I just want the joint to look good and nothing else at this point, not worrying about strength really at all. After the glue had dried for a day or so, I could get to work on the epoxy locking joint reinforcement or whatever I called it. But anyway, the basic idea was this. Make a joint, don't worry about the strength, and then cut a shape into it and fill it with epoxy for looks and to reinforce it. And you could cut this manually or with a CNC. But for my purposes, I'm gonna use a CNC. More specifically, my X-Carve. So here you've been seeing me model in my first idea, which is basically like a butterfly or bow tie. Once I was happy with the shape, I exported it from SketchUp as an SVG file that I could import into ESOL to cut on my X-Carve. Then with an easel, I had to kind of eyeball it, so what I wanted the center of the cut to be was positioned right at the 00, zero origin within the software. Then, in real life, over on the X-Carve, I positioned my bit so that it was at the center of the joint, and hit carve and let it do its thing. And for the most part, I'd say that this went really smoothly. I only had one mess up on one joint, and it was definitely user error where I kind of positioned things bad as a starting point. Now, normally I probably wouldn't do four different cuts for something like this. I'd just pick one and repeat it. But since this was an experiment, I wanted to try it a few different ideas. So I ended up going with the aforementioned bow tie, this sort of spline look, a puzzle piece, and what I'm calling joint inception, which is basically like a shrunken down version of the entire leg. And for that one, I thought about leaving an even smaller repeat of the same shape in the middle of the epoxy, but it was just getting too small to really see the shape repeating, so I abandoned that idea. But I think one of the things that I took away from this project was that I probably don't experiment as much as I would like to with my CNC, so it was fun to kind of mess around on this project. And I think it's something that actually has some less goofy applications that I can try out down the road. Also, for anybody interested in getting into the world of digital fabrication, I'll leave a link to the X-Carve in the description below, so you can check it out. Okay, the next step was to pour the epoxy. But before I did that, I made sure to spend some time doing a really thorough job of taping up everything, because I did not want it to leak. And once I felt like that was good, I used Total Boat Thickset, which is their deep pour system. And this is the same stuff that I used on the crayon table and the splinter console. And whenever applicable, I'd say that this is my favorite epoxy to use because for whatever reason, I don't get any air bubbles with it. And it just seems to dry the clearest in my eyes. Now, with the shop being colder this time of year, I've been giving my epoxy a good two to three days of cure time before I sand anything. So pretty much I just let these guys sit for Christmas and then came back and sanded everything flat using some 80 grit and a little elbow grease. And then from there, I proceeded to sand up through the grits to 400 and then did a little polishing as a final pass. Now, like I said earlier, this project was very much an experiment. In a more finished version, I don't think that I'd do a separate shape at each joint, and in fact, I'd probably make a much more square-shaped base overall, not something so angular. That way the joints could really be the star. And for those reasons, as a finished piece in a vacuum, I'd say that this is probably not my best work. But as an investigation of this technique, I'd call it a success. As for what'll become of this piece, well, I think it's proven its point, served its useful life, and can rest easy knowing that its sacrifices will certainly lead to bigger, better things. And for that, we commend you. Special thanks to Mitchell M., Matt Kendrick, Jeff McInnes, Ryan, Dan Murphy, Blake Nash, Peyton Guess, Herbert Brown, and the rest of my Patreon members for making these videos possible. We also commend you. And if you'd like to find out more about how you can support the show too, pick up a fancy Four Eyes t-shirt, and potentially even be commended, check out the Patreon link in the description and see if it's right for you. And as always, no pressure. Alright, 
See you in the next one.